we come into the world moving, we're, we're precisely not stillborn. Indeed, movement forms the eye that moves before the eye that moves forms movement. We make incohate reaching movements before we effectively reach and grasp. We kick our legs before we crawl or walk. We babble and coo before we speak. We move before we judge directions or navigate across distances from A to B or have any kind of concept of distances. We learn our bodies from the beginning. We learn our bodies and learn to move ourselves. We do so without an instructions manual and without any instructions from other people. How do we do this? We learn to move ourselves. We learn our bodies and we learn to move ourselves. In the process, we form non-linguistic concepts, what I call corporeal concepts because they emanate from our own bodily experiences of movement. We learn far and near, we learn fast and slow, we learn in, inside, on, underneath. We learn um, concepts that have to do with space and time and force non-linguistically. Indeed, there would be absolutely no basis for language unless we had formed some of these concepts from the very beginning on the basis of our having learned our bodies and learned to move ourselves. We also relate to other people through movement, through our awareness of our own tactile kinesthetic bodies, and through our awareness of the kinetic dynamics of others. We learn this through play, through affect attunement, and through more sophisticated forms of, of, uh, of dance. I would like to uh, introduce you to what we just saw. Um, the first segment that we saw on uh, the bear play was produced by um, uh, Robert Fagan in relation to his uh, animal studies behavior. Robert Fagan is here in the blue, light blue shirt. Um, the next segment that we saw was uh, called Contact Improvisation. And Contact Improvisation is the, um, is the form of dance that, was, uh, that originated with Steve Paxton, who is here on my left. Uh, Steve was originally a dancer with Merce Cunningham and um, uh, ventured forth to, to um, create this form of dance called contact improvisation. The third segment that we saw, the shorter segment, was from a dance called Revelations that was uh, choreographed by Alvin Ailey. Um, it's a... Uh, um, it was a, a um, shorter piece at the very end that was actually choreographed, whereas contact improvisation is unchoreographed. It's, an, it's something that happens in the moment. What I want to do is to start the discussion this evening um, on play, affect attunement, and dance improvisation in the way in which they are interlinked in terms of, of movement. Um, prior to that, I, I would like to read something to you because I, I um, have noticed in the, in the Philoctetes um, heading, there's always the, a mention of the imagination. And the imagination doesn't come into play very often, it seemed to me, except in one instance where there was a whole roundtable discussion on in imagination. Isn't that right, Ellen? It's right, but there's usually, uh, there comes into discussion one way or the other. Oh, okay. Like well, I would like to, <laughs> I would like to read this very short uh, 
uh, quote because it seems to me very, very pertinent to our discussion tonight in terms of dance, movement, and bodies, and specifically with respect to play and affect. And um, I will need my glasses, I forgot. For everyone whose guiding principle is adaptation to external reality, imagination is for these reasons something reprehensible and useless. And yet we know that every good idea and all creative work are the offspring of the imagination and have their source in what one is pleased to call infantile fantasy. Not the artist alone, but every creative individual whatsoever owes all that is greatest in his life to fantasy. The dynamic principle of fantasy is play a characteristic also of the child, and as such, it appears inconsistent with the principle of serious work. But without this playing with fantasy, no creative work has ever yet come to birth. The debt we owe to the play of imagination is incalculable. That's from Carl Jung, Psychological Types. But I thought that was very pertinent to, to our discussion tonight. Let me uh, introduce, first of all, I want to thank Ellen Furting very, very much. I want to thank Adam Ludwig and also Miguel uh, Noguera, who did the uh, uh, DVDs for me. Ellen has been an inestimable help, but I really do appreciate everything that you've done. This, as I said, this person here on my left is Steve Paxton. This is Joanna Harris, who is a dance historian, has practiced as a dance therapist, has been a dancer, choreographer, and has gone the gamut of, of dance in many, many dimensions. Robert Fagan I introduced as a, a originally an evolutionary biologist who has done a lot of dance in uh, ballet in uh, Juneau, Alaska. And Daniel Stern, whom I was sure that all of you were already already familiar with, uh, who is uh, an infant psychiatrist who has written eloquently on infants and uh, affect attunement and relationships between mother and infant. So we will begin our roundtable discussion with uh, play and affect attunement and contact improvisation. Um, there are two aspects that I would like to, or two observations perhaps I would like to mention, and you may play with them or you can go off in whatever direction you want to. But one of them is the fact that in play and in contact improvisation and in affect attunement as well, the future is unknown. There is no structure that is pre-given so that what happens is all created on the spot in a way that can be a source of insecurity for people because there is not something already known and anticipated that's going to happen. So that can put people at, uh, make people feel ill at ease, lack of, of uh, comfortableness. The second point that I would like to just make as an observation, and you can do with it what you will, is just to say that precisely because of this uh, non-structured future, that thinking and movement is a very important dimension in play, in affect attunement, and in contact improvisation, because one is not uh, uh, doing anything which has some kind of set forward motion to it. It's all structured in the, in the moment. And it evolves on the basis of thinking and movement. So you may take off in whatever direction you like to do so. Yeah, Maxine, you ended your introduction with the words thinking and movement. And you know, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I think that's a really important concept. And 
may not be familiar to everyone here. I, I know that, you know, with all of my supposed credentials in behavioral biology, it was new to me when I first heard it from you. Well, in the video, in the DVDs that we saw, what evolves and the way in which the relationships happen, um, either between the animals or among the people who are dancing, it's, it's certainly not anything which is language dependent. And we usually think of, of thinking as being language dependent, that language, thinking, and rationality are all, it's, a, it's an inviolate triumvirate of some kind or other. And um, we, don't th we don't remember having thought in movement in terms of, of, um, of our early life and, have, and having learned how to navigate in the world by way of movement, which is the way we learn in the beginning. So thinking in movement, I, I gave an example once of... Um, if you're walking along a path and there's a big stone in your path, you, you automatically make some kind, because you already know what it is to think in movement, you don't think, oh, there is a stone in my path, I have to lift my leg, I have to extend it, I have to step over, make an effort. You think in movement and your walk proceeds in a very regular, uh, unbroken fashion. So it's in that sense that thinking in movement uh, is seems to me a very, a very basic way in which, just in our everyday lives, that we we think. Does that, Dan? Could, could I um, try to answer that in one way, developmentally, <clears throat> at least? Um, I, you can put the question like this. Um, why did nature make babies so that they couldn't? Yeah. Why did nature make babies so that they couldn't talk for the first two years of their life, nor understand words? I mean, they understand tone of voice and melody. <clears throat> and um, especially in light of this question, in light of the fact that the more people look at babies, the more they realize how smart they are, how well they navigate the world, how they have representations of things, how they can anticipate, how they can recall and have memories of events and repeat them or not repeat them. Um, and one of the answers is that during the first couple of years, 18 months, the baby has to learn the infrastructure, the most basic fundamental parts of being a human being, especially with other people. They have to learn these simple things that we all know to do and don't think about much, like when you're with somebody, what do you do with your eyes? When can you look at them in the face? When should you turn away? How far do you have to turn away your head? Do you turn it down or do you turn it up? They mean very different things in a baby's life. You have to learn who can I touch, who can't I touch, with how much pressure, how how strongly can I bite someone? How do you put your mouth so you can kiss? What distance can I be relative to another person? What orientation? Of, you know, it's the whole world. And I think nature decided that you don't want language when you're learning all that stuff because language would absolutely screw it up. <laughs> and you could never learn it. And I, I think that this is not unimportant. Um, and you know, I'd like to add just one thing to what you said about lifting your foot with the stone. And I know you know all this because it, it's like um, kinesthetic concepts and corporeal concepts. Um, but I, I, there's an example that intrigues me from um, um, from Lakoff and Johnson. They have a similar concept to Maxine's. Um, they call it primary metaphor. And look at it this way. This is what language is based on. Take a baby, can't talk, but they can move around, crawl or walk. So they know how to get from here to there. They know how to start. They know how to get there. They know how to stop. They know how to change the direction. So that becomes part of this corporeal knowledge about what happens in the world. So then when I say to another adult who asks me, well, how, how are you and Sally doing? I say, well... 
our relationship it got off to a good start. But you know, it really only got so far. Now, where is so far? Where is far? And then our relationship stopped. And, I don't know, we went in opposite directions, okay? Now, it's so easy to understand because you have the body knowledge on which the language can rest. See, otherwise it would be really hard to explain what I said really quite simply about it. And language is absolutely filled with these kind of things so that it's both layering the language on the body knowledge as well as not even needing the language as you're talking about. If that helps. So <laughs> and in dance therapy, the task often is to help people or make the environment in which some of that learning can be trusted again. Because perhaps they haven't been paying attention to it or they've distanced themselves from their own kinesthetic feedback and within that feedback is often the emotional material they might want to feel, deal with if possible. So the process that you described in the child development is often the stages that <clears throat> the dance therapy process um, emanates, I mean tries to structure so that those, those senses of near, far, what is possible, who can I touch, etc., are available. And they get lost or what? <laughs> they become not available, and I, those of you who are in the psychiatric world will know why they become not available. They're blocked, they're resisted, they're frightening, they're socially not acceptable. They're there but they haven't been practiced in a way, or they haven't been paid attention to. I mean, how do you know what you feel? It's a very hard question for people. And I don't mean feel in terms of the emotive pattern. I mean in terms of what does your body feel like? How far is far? You know, how do you, far do you reach before you're going to be on the floor? Where is that? Those things often become very frightening because the child... The childhood state is been closed off or just not comfortable. Dan, I'd like to play devil's advocate so that we can exercise a particular nasty devil right now. Uh, the white-tailed deer that the suburbs have more than enough of and our Sitka black-tailed deer that deserve to thrive and prosper are born in an advanced developmental state. They do a lot of running around their mothers and charging this way and that. But there is totally nothing like the very sophisticated, elegant uh, mother-young play that you see in humans or chimpanzees or brown bears or tigers or snow leopards. Uh, but you know, I would think that even something as uh, relatively straightforward as a deer would need to know some of these same sorts of basic social things because deer do form groups and travel together and, and so on. So when is the, the turnover point? I mean, I, I don't really believe in genes. Don't get me going on that one or we'll be here all night. But, you know, I feel like there, are, there are some things that you know, DNA in the right kind of body can teach you about social behavior. And by the time you get from the common ancestor of deer and humans to deer on the one hand and humans on the other, it almost looks like two completely different roads. Um, I, I didn't. I didn't want to suggest, although it probably sounded that way, is if you have to learn all these things. Uh, uh, you know, it brings me back to something that seems to have uh, lost favor in the world, and that is human ethology, which was so promising, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, um, where I suspect that the deer can get along pretty well on largely innate patterns with only a little bit of learning. Uh, where there are releasers in the environment for fixed action patterns in the deer, so they do very well. And a lot of the things that babies learn, 
I have to put quotes around the brain, are behavioral patterns that they have genetically available to them. And then it's a question of are they going to get utilized or not? And what is the fine tuning that the culture is going to give to the utilization? So I can't split out what's genetic and what's learning since they seem to go so. I mean, I, even something that's culturally specific, although very wide, like uh, putting your lips together to kiss someone, we have the action pattern to do that. Just how you gonna, what are you going to do with it? No, it's, it's strange about the deer because the releasers do seem to be very prominent. I, mean, I, I first got my eyes open to play when I saw a deer running through shallow water in uh, Morris County, New Jersey's Great Swamp. I thought, I thought they'd gone crazy. And I've, I've seen a little bit of this in the Sitka blacktails, but what the Sitka deer out where I live in southeast Alaska seem to do is each spring when the new vegetation comes out after the long dark winter, it really seems to turn on play when you get some of the uh, sedges coming out and the early leaves on the salmon berries and the blueberries. It releases the same kind of behavior that the water did in the deer in the swamp. And it's so specific to that time and that place that it turns out to be mighty hard to study play in Sitka black-tailed deer unless you can arrange a situation where you are there for those few days when the green vegetation is coming out. The rest of the year, I wouldn't say they're boring, but from the point of view of a play researcher, there isn't a whole lot you can do. Do we need to define play or talk more about play in terms of what? I was just thinking of Winnicott's wonderful book, Playing in Reality, where, again, the child relationship is redeveloped in the therapeutic situation very gently. And it's become a very important book, at least it was for me, in developing a, quote, theoretical model for what we do with people when we want them to move with us more than talk to us. And I think that's that playing to rehearse, to try to put aside the expectation is, is a very important step in just that getting in touch with the environment, the self, the other person. I'm a little bit of a problem. Contact improvisation we saw has remained kind of uh, uh, like a monotone for at least the last 15 years. So if it's so unstructured, why is it uh, uh, presenting a structure to us? In the same way, that, Dan, when I saw your uh, films of the What do we call Affect it? Attunement. Affect attunement between mother and uh, infant. Uh, it seems like you were showing a, a, a kind of constant that that would be there. How the affect was tuned, uh, uh, and it seems to me like contact improvisation sort of shows an, an element of that. Whereas, as stilted to my eye as uh, Dudley dancing the Ailey looks, you know, and the, the Graham technical uh, dance form being such an antique at this point, still that is the place where we don't know where it's going to go. And that's the place where it isn't a natural constant that we're seeing, but this unnatural developed uh, quite bizarre form of movement which deer are never going to 
<laughs> accomplish. Yeah. You, know? you know, Steve, I wouldn't worry too much about contact. My guess is that it's just an instance in human behavior of punctuated equilibrium. And somebody is going to come along and say, we're the new generation, and De create something. Yeah, de yeah, I, I don't understand why you're saying that it's a, uh, it seems to have come to a standstill. What do you mean? I think it's a constant. What do you I mean by a constant? I don't, I think, you know, it's related to Dan's work. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan Stern did a lecture down uh, in Soho in the early 70s. And uh, I was working on contact, just the, it didn't even have a name at that point, but it was beginning to think about touch and weight and all of that. And when Dan showed his work, which was uh, extreme, well, micro movement in this attunement, you know, so you could really see how the attunement was going. Jump in if I if I misdirect uh, everybody, but um, I realized that what I was working on was related to this uh, innate uh, event in all our lives. You know how we attune essentially is I guess the the event that I'm talking about, and then how as adults we can tune, how we can tune to each other or. Uh, given permissions or modulations somehow in the improvisational relationship between modulations are there, then that's what shows up. Uh, this was highly developed group, you know, you didn't see uh, fumbling attempts uh, in this particular performance. This was the uh, 10th anniversary performance, so people had been going for 10 years. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't see, there are many movement styles, events, uh, one could almost talk about syntaxes, maybe, that are absent in, in contact improvisation. I do think it will be, at some point, actually, I've been trying to do it. <laughs> I was, uh, uh, it will be burst apart at, at some point. You know, it will be reopened, and and uh, I've been mining it uh, for a while now myself, uh, and making a technique uh, to uh, develop further. But uh, it does have the play. The play definitely has uh, sets forth a, a statement of some sort. But I just don't quite. It, it seems. I don't think we're going to see mothers and children, dear mothers, dear children, developing different behaviors uh, in the short term. There's, whereas in the dance, in the, in the choreographed dance, you can develop whatever behavior, you know. You no, the, there's, there's openness in deer play and in all animal play, but looking at the contact improv and the amount of inventiveness and variety there and the kinds of themes that movement themes that came in if you study animals even chimpanzees it just blows you away there's a real watershed there they don't do it it's with much no i mean what was the you, you might come you might come close to a in some groups of common chimpanzees or bonobos. And you might see something like that in elephants or bottlenose dolphins. But that is about as much, I think, as you could probably hope for. And there would still be obvious differences. Well, doesn't this uh, relate, though, to the fact that humans have a far, far broader range of movement because of their bipedal, uh, because of bipedality than uh, non-human animals. Because even though chimpanzees uh, and even baboons can walk upright, that they don't have the, uh, the range of movement of, of humans. And they, they're, because they don't have the 
the possibilities of ballistic movement, that their movements are more limited. I think it, it may relate to that, but also to something more um, mental. Um, and, and that brings us back to imagination. Because um, play uh, requires a level of imagination uh, sort of, or intersubjectivity. You have to imagine what's going on in the other person's mind in order to play. Um, and the question is, you know, getting back to play, you know, Winnicott and most of us certainly in, in, the, in the psych fields talk about symbolic play. And I'm not going to talk about symbolic play, I'm going to talk about purely physical play where you see much more imagination from my point of view. And in fact, if you watch preschool age kids or kids in kindergarten, and you watch them in the playground where there are no teachers and no parents, the most common activity that they engage in is imitation. And then the next most common is a set of lying, cheating, tricking, and mucking up in general. Now, to lie, cheat, and trick requires an exquisite imaginative leap to know what the other person is going to do, or to at least make an estimation so you can do something different. And the other person has to make an imaginative leap with regard to what you're likely to infer about what they're doing. All of this nonverbal. And um, then you see patterns much like what, what you showed us tonight, where they, I mean, these people, I mean, they're all super dancers, but they're throwing themselves around with a certain anticipatory, an imaginative anticipatory expectation of what the other person is going to be able to handle in the next split second, especially like that, that girl who throws herself in the air at people. But she knows where they're at, and she knows what their capacities for receiving her are, and all that stuff. But there were also a lot of surprises, because those people are fooling each other, too. There's a lot of trickery going on, which is part of the fun part, to see them do that. And this is what the kids are doing all the time. And it's not like you see something, then you've got to respond. Everybody has to coordinate their tricks. Uh, otherwise, it, it doesn't work. And it looks like it's about the tricks, but it's really about the coordination. J just briefly, I once did an analysis of a film, which was a, a world heavyweight championship boxing match between Muhammad Ali and this German Milton Berger. And what was fascinating about it was, I knew that the reaction time in a pretty good athlete is in the range of a quarter of a second. And I timed how long it took either Muhammad Ali or the other guy to throw a jab. And it turned out they can throw a jab faster than a quarter of a second, which means that the other guy should get hit every time. And they get hit, what, one out of 20, one out of 40, depends on the fight, which means that they were anticipating each other and moving into a synchronous dance pattern where there were just milliseconds of lag in order for them to do this kind of thing. You see, that's what I was thinking about with the bears. Now, when, when mama bear there goes to get the side of the baby bear, the baby bear knows her pre-intention movement so the baby bear can then go like this or go in another direction. So they're doing it too, it seems to me, because they're, they're not, they don't bump their heads together. <laughs> they, no, I mean, no, but I'm serious. They don't. They seem to do it very, you know, like this, really nice. <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking that there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, with a lot of the mother bears, uh, they really do seem to attune the pace and phrasing and rhythm of their movements to what a little bear cub is capable of. Because uh, little bears freak out very easily. Uh, I've seen them panic and run for the trees when they see a salmon. And it's really 
a pretty dumb thing to do because those trees are hundreds of meters away and there are a lot of big bears around. So how those mothers keep the little ones from panicking is really non-trivial. Mm -hmm. And it couldn't happen without the kinds of things that you're talking mm -hmm. about. And Steve, when you, when you were saying that, uh, about the, you used the word constant, it's not a constant. What exactly were you referring to in that kind of play? That the, the lack of rehearsal, the lack of intimate knowledge among the people? I wanted to differentiate between this sense of play and the play that you were referring I to. I think it is a, a constant. It's Contact improvisation, it seems to me, is a level of behavior which reveals a, a constant in the same way and growing from this moment of affect attunement right. which it seems to me is a constant in behavior between mother and so all, what's the all mothers and all children if I can be so I mean what do you but think so the all cons the constant some? is the micro movement and the cueing which is so intrinsic to the moving body no that the the activity seems in the minds of the people doing it to be complete in and of uh, itself with the tricks and, and um, uh, surprises um, that can occur, especially in a relaxed but still formal situation yeah. as this was, you know. And, and yet, initially, those moves have to be rehearsed and practiced until they get to a certain kind of spontaneity is that not true the physical skill to improvise not very much really? I teach Nita wasn't able to jump up like that when she first started was she um, the tapes exist <laughs> the tapes exist uh, the oh it'd be really nice to be able to do the archives you know just for some there is a tape of the the woman who lung herself uh, sideways at the man who was running and uh, was caught learning to fling herself in which uh, and also learning to catch so you see her learning that behavior so there was learning of about well intensively several weeks and in general sort of occasionally over the rest of that summer in 72 when this sort right. of began. Now she's a wizard at it, you know. <laughs> but it is, at, at this point, it was 10 years later. Mm -hmm. They pushed the boundaries themselves, but they didn't particularly invest it imaginatively, I think. It, it looks to me like they got better at it, they trusted it, the reaction time situation got more uh, uh, clear and more refined. But it's, um, mm, I don't see it invested with different mind or imagination than it always was. May I ask you a question then? Is it, is, is it, is it uh, something similar to the way in which we in our everyday lives get into certain habitual patterns so that it becomes a habitual kind of uh, would you classify it as habitual ways of moving? Habitual ways of improvising. Can we make yeah. that kind of leap? <laughs> yeah. It is still, I think, improvisational, especially considering that um, you saw her dancing with some of her students. The, the woman you saw flinging herself around taught a number of the men on whom she was flinging herself. <laughs> and in those days, uh, it was... Um, it was expected of a contact improviser from the earliest days to be ready for anything to happen to them. That is, it, it was understood that somebody might jump on you from behind or, or any, from any direction so that there would be no preparation time. And you were expected on touch to be able to deal with that weight. And we got so that we could do it. We got so it wasn't a problem to do it. So that's why this is not... Uh, but at the same time, then it becomes ordinary being leapt on, you know. It's like <laughs> but still the it would be amazing on the street if somebody right. jumped on you, you know. But uh, 
uh, but the imagination and anticipation that Dan talked about had been then accepted and bodily experienced and so that it could be become the imagination. the imagination he was talking about of what might happen, the trickery and the uh, and un you know un part of the life. unanticipated it's becomes it's anticipated, not that it is predictable, but it's one of the many kinesthetic right. impulses right. and the kinesthetic responses that I could have. Right. Well, you know, when, when I call it imagination, I think I'm stretching the concept a little bit because it's also no different from having expectations. Um, but on the other hand, when you think through expectations, um, where, in fact, you don't know the storyline, um, you do have to make some kind of leap with regard to what's likely to happen, which requires some kind of leap into the other person's intentional system. So in that sense, it's imagination, but in a very weak sense, but still. Well, I think the element of surprise is worth expanding a little bit, because that's certainly one of the paradoxes of play, that with the repetition and the variation, you get the expected and the surprise. And you can really pick that one up and run with it all the way from a dyadic relationship to macroevolution. I mean, you, you can imagine the dinosaurs being too dumb to play <laughs> so that when the meteorite hit, uh, they were done for. And the... the, the uh, they couldn't throw the meteorite back, is that it? <laughs> Or no adaptation, no change was possible. They, they couldn't play with the environment that resulted, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that the line? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a fun story to get uh, some thoughts going. But, I mean, the, the fact is that there is a lot of play that seems to build a relationship to the unpredictable. And there's you know, a wonderful Stephen Jay Gouldian hierarchy in all of this that goes all the way from the very short-term individual developmental time scales to the lifespan to the life of a deem over a few generations and onwards and upwards to the actual kinds of things that he and Eldridge talk about when they talk about what makes macroevolution different. And for mammals and birds, a lot of that seems to start in play. So we're actually at the point now of asking ourselves, how can we test this? Uh, can we actually look at speciation and extinction rates in brainy animals in terms of play and its hypothesized ability to anticipate the unknown. You know, it, it's a really exciting time in, in play research, and I really have to thank Steve Gould, now that I'm on his home turf only a few miles from Yankee Stadium, for some discussions of neoteny many years ago that got these thoughts percolating through my, my much less capable brain. If it's appropriate, I have a super example of um, mm -hmm. mother-baby play with um, um, where it's a question of surprise, uh, expectancies, violations, and whatnot. If I could show it, yeah? It, it just take me a minute. Um, I, I'll get over here so much. Sure. Oh. Take your wire. <laughs> This is not a shell game. <laughs> Most popular cross-cultural game that I know to make a baby under a year um, laugh or smile is a form of peekaboo, uh, most commonly in the form of like, I'm going to get you. 
you hold the baby like this and go, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. And finally you got them. And they laugh. But when you look at it closely, it's, it's a huge dance with a rhythmic structure and a progression. And what happens is, this is time moving this way. And the mother says, I'm going to get you. The baby looks at her. And uh, then she says, she repeats it. She says, I'm going to get you about this much time away. And so the baby gets more alert. And then the baby says, OK, the next one's going to come right about here. Here. So the mother goes, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. So she violates the expectancy by a little bit. And the baby gets even more interested. And he says, OK, I got that wrong. The next one should be here, right there. And so she goes, I'm going to get you. 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 So she violates progressively more. At this point, the baby is blown up. <laughs> He's absolutely about to explode with excitement. I don't know what this is. <laughs> so he says to himself, Non-verbally. <laughs> Non-verbally through movement and appreciation of temporal... Right, intention. Yeah. Intention and, and temporal um, units. Right. He says to himself, okay, my mother's being tricky, but I know that game. That's the game of progressive temporal violations. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Wonderful. Which the baby can do. It's a question of being on the beat or off the beat and whether that's moving in the right direction. So he says, my mother's tricky. She's going to have the next one somewhere out here. So the mother goes, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. Gotcha. <laughs> right there, and the baby explodes in laughter. Because the baby's been violated again at the short end. Yeah. Now, if she had gone, gotcha, there, the baby would have cried. It would have been like a baby bear going up the tree. Because they're too overloaded, and they can't handle it and the system falls apart. If, she, if, the, if the mother did it out here, the baby would kind of go, that wasn't so funny. You know, <laughs> essentially like that. So you see a corporeal concept mm. having been constructed in this unbelievably common game. Right. There are a hundred variations of this mm. kind of thing. So, and and they, set up, they can set up the representation of what that consists of very, very quickly. This is baby five, six months. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about talking people. You know, or even walking people. <laughs> believe it or not, I think the same thing happens with audiences in dance performances. Absolutely. <laughs> because I see people who've gone to the ballet for 25 years, or modern dance, or anything, and they say, well, there's going to be two pirouettes, and then a split leap, and she'll catch them, and they'll do a swan dive. But the, they don't remember the choreography, or the choreography isn't done by the same people the same 42 times they've seen it before. And they say, wow, I've never seen that before. And they explode in the same way. And in that way, no matter how skilled and predictable dance choreography is, it still has that sense of in the moment, and that anticipation of the physical kinesthetic release that happens when the person is caught or when the thing is executed and you say, how did they do that? Yeah. Well, I've been told, but I don't know that this is really true, that in the prose, when you're doing partnering and you've got a season when you do the same piece a lot, the partners actually try to surprise each other and go outside the choreography <laughs> just to keep it fresh. I think so. I've talked to lots of people in dance, and, and I know some of the things they have told me that they do. Oh, wow. Tickles and wiggles and... That is so amazing. I mean, if I tried that with the kids, I would be in big trouble, especially with their moms and dads. <laughs> well, they, you said they're pros. You're talking about pros now. Yeah. It's different than the students. Yeah. I want to open it up to the group. Uh, are there any questions or any comments from anybody? Uh, yes. Just share the mic. 
Posterity. <laughs> Posterity is just around the corner. I, um, my name is Anthony Macagnoni. Uh, the gentleman on the left, the name Steve. 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 Yeah, were, were you saying that was not contact improvisation in its purest form? I, I couldn't, I missed that. The constant. And, uh, uh, I'm saying that it was contact improvisation and it was very pure, free form improvisation, which is just about all I've seen since it started. <laughs> But do you think it, 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 it should go even further, or was it Well, we didn't know it, where it was going to go. I always thought contact improvisation would be a total spontaneity without any kind of, some little f set form, but then it would just be uh, what it is in this very spontaneous moment, and not the practice and the practice and the practice and the practice. So I thought you were negative on that by saying it was a, a constant and not true with contact improvisation really was sort of meant to be. I, I got just confused on uh, the uh, up. Uh, got it. Okay. Um, it's modulated improvisation. Improvisation doesn't mean, seem to me anyway, maybe uh, somebody here has another viewpoint and I'd love to discuss this, but because I've been thinking about it for far too long by myself. It seems to me like improvisation doesn't have a meaning that can stick around because it's always got to be moving on. I mean, uh, they're teaching cool jazz improvisation, you know, at the Berklee School of Music, and you learn it note by note, you know, and, and you, you get the style and, and you, you know, uh, soon can do it. And it's so that's. Um, Improvisation is meant, or, or it seems to me, to operate uh, uh, um, in this way that Robert said, uh, that some, the next generation will come along and, and further develop or burst it apart or something like that. And um, that was contact improvisation. It was by a rather elite group of contactors. Uh, I mentioned that it was therefore uh, didn't have a lot of common um, slow movement and stuff like that. These people all know each other and um, are, you know, have been doing it together for years. So it, it, it lost some of the affect attunement element that uh, is often there when people begin to learn it. But isn't that a quintessential element in improvisation? But improvisation doesn't have quintessential elements. It has, um, it's something that you could do with, and it, it has to do with lack of form, right? That is to say, but it doesn't last very long in that way. It starts off, we didn't know what we were doing. We knew sort of what we were doing. Seeing Daniel Stern's work let me think that it was founded innately in us as human beings to be able to play this game, that it's not, uh, it, it's not an artistic overlay on top of human behavior. It is part of human behavior that is now in this kind of dancing um, uh, very much developed and amplified and done by adults as opposed to uh, you know, a, a, a mother. It's not an artistic overlay. You feel that is not an artistic overlay. I'm saying there isn't an artistic overlay, uh, um, in at first in improvisation. The artistic overlay comes later, sort of. It gets. Well, I guess I guess what I'm saying is that it's 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 a modulated it's a modulated improvisation. It already when it came out already had. Um, uh, a direction, the the words I used, the examples I gave, the things we found together as a group, created a direction which it seems to me has remained sort of uh, constant since '72 when it began, or maybe since '73 or '74 when it sort of got uh, into the bodies. People began to trust it as a form, uh, but. Um, you can improvise 
within forms. I mean, games are that yeah. kind of thing. So right. play contains a lot of that. Some play, it seems to me, the, the kind of play of the bears that we saw, the kind of... Um, it, it, the bears seem to me very much involved in contact play. I mean, the, the contact, as, as you mentioned about the timing, uh, was uh, very much an, uh, an element besides the biting and the squatting and all of that business. But improvisation does not have the kind of freedom that, the, the, as a word, it does have that freedom. As a word, as, as a, a linguistic uh, event, you know, we don't know what we're talking about. That's the important thing about that word. But actually, as a practice, it very quickly takes on uh, characteristics and then loses the, the freedom that we keep yeah. saying exists. I don't, I'm not sure there is such a thing as that kind of freedom Period. for us. Yeah, yeah. For language, in language, we can get there. In language, we can say these things. Whether we can behaviorally right. uh, play that game, I'm not sure. Right. It's a question mark. In dance and in dance therapy, um, there's some physical safety, especially with adults, that we, I think of as givens. You don't want people, well, there are some dancers who do it, but I don't want people who I work with to run and hit themselves against the wall. So I might, might set some, if they're not able to absorb that, so I might set some givens. But how that's accomplished and the timing that it's accomplished in, one of the basic things that we often in dance therapy is start on the floor and get up. Now, that seems like a very simple thing. We do it in 20 seconds or less. But for many people, they will take a half an hour and then finally say, I didn't want to get up. And that's a very interesting. Or they don't even have to say it. They just don't get up. But, the, but from sitting or lying to standing is a quite an interesting journey. And it's an improvisation. I don't, there's no other direction. So saying, saying staying on the floor is a given. No, experience. don't say stay on the floor is start on the floor. Yeah, I don't say stay on the floor. Well, I just on, yeah. start on the floor, which is where we all like to be eventually. <laughs> but getting up isn't always half the fun, or it is the fun. Anyhow, but that's the kind of improvisation that you take then in a more... Well, I take it into dance therapy situation, but it's also a dancer's situation. When you find out how you go from lying to standing, you find out a great deal about gravity, your adaptation in your back, and blah, blah, blah. And therefore, you might then use that improvisation as a basis of recall and more choreographic elaboration. Uh, if I may, uh, uh, here comes somebody. Uh, my name is David Hecht. Um, this, this particular discussion seems to be a good point, which we used earlier, to um, bring imagination back in. Um, and what uh, struck me is that the description you give of improvisation um, as something irregular in linguistic, you know, it's, it's wide open linguistically, but in terms of movement, there is some sense of limitation. There's a, um, uh, there's some sort of, you know, something you can approach, but you won't hit. You'll, you'll be tending towards this sort of uh, boundary of, of what can be done. And that, to me, is where um, imagination sort of extends the uh, possibilities. Um, in a sense, imagination defines what's possible, and it sounds to me like this training that goes on and the elements that make up the um, actual improvisation, the very the structural procedures that are shared, uh, are sort of the things that make uh, certain movements more probable. So that uh, over 20, 30 years of doing these same sorts of things, there are sets of motions that will likely follow from one another. Um, However, the, the, the outer limit of what those movements can be was defined by trying something new that hadn't been tried before, which is that imaginative leap. Um, so I think it sounds to me like there are many factors going on here. There's imagination, there's structure, there's looseness, there's dependencies upon physical relationships where someone throws themselves out because they understand at a very implicit level the capabilities of other people. I've used in my own research um, experiments that look at two people working together who um, are not allowed to communicate. They have to pick up a, a board on a, on a, tra on a 
conveyor belt, and the, it was found that the way in which they did was they calculate arm lengths and the length of a board and relate to each other in terms of their respective capabilities. So it seems to me that that's another factor mm. where people look at each other and are able to assess what their physical capabilities are. So it seems to me that there's a very multivariate um, set of factors here, which include imagination, structure, openness, and all these things. And I think it provides a nice sort of unity to understand, you know, how these things can develop and be expressed. And communication comes from a culture. All these things, I think, launch out of it. And that's just what I wanted to say. <laughs> um. I'd like to follow up uh, in part on what this person has said because it can follow up on Steve's uh, comment about being stuck because uh, um, it seems to me that part of it is breaking through our habits, whether they're habits within dance or in our habits in everyday life. And um, if you thought of this uh, as, for example, um, decontact improvisation, where you didn't have the possibility of, I mean, you could fling yourself, but nobody would be there, then you'd have to learn a new way of moving because nobody would be there. And that would be an imaginative, I mean, opening. So, uh, in other words, um, even moving, I mean, moving in, a, in ways that are non-habitual for all of us is just a very, very... Uh, a threatening even kind of situation in that uh, if we don't break out of our habits then we just keep on the same narrow track and we don't discover new things and we're not awakened in new ways and our life becomes one habitual uh, pattern after the next. So it seems to me in part isn't it a question uh, of opening? How do we open ourselves to new ways of being? new ways of being in the world, and new ways of developing our own capacity so that we don't stay stuck in our, in our grooves. Is that, does that ring any bells? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have a, th a thought about this and the whole improvisation problem, which, yeah, you, okay. you, you brought up. Um, more and more, I tend not to think in terms of, is it improvisation or is it structured? But rather to see um, different uh, um, combinations of them and degrees of them. Um, so that if you use a different system, like dynamic systems theory, you know, sort of like chaos theory of a kind, um, I think that you find that most things go along in a semi-structured way, and then all of a sudden there's an emergent property that you can't predict, which is where you all of a sudden do a new movement or you receive a new movement. Um, and that sets it in another direction, and it now becomes different. Hmm? And these are not predictable and they're not planable. After you've gone through a moment of which is more chaotic and less structured, then you revert back to the semi-structured thing. So for instance, take, taking the dance as an example, uh, let, let's say the uh, one, one dancer takes his arm around the other person's body like, like this. Um, now, she can do a lot of things, and this person, um, it seems to me that um, as soon as you've done this, um, there are not only constraints on what you can do next physically, which is what I feel, yeah, what you were saying, but there are implications of what's possible, and they they can either be surprised and violated or not, because most of the time when you do that, you see some kind of counter movement on the other person's part, which is harmonious with one of the implications that was inherent in this movement. And so in a way, it's, it becomes semi-structured. The moment, the moment this person has done this, you're already in a semi-structure. Mm -hmm. and, and then you go along automatically almost doing them until there's another one of these emergent properties that comes up like that. So, so that there is a flux between what is truly improvised or which really comes from the interaction, not from anyone's head. 
uh, and then and then after that they they work it through or out or something like that. So the word improvisation is a funny word. I understand well why you use it, yeah. but it doesn't capture what what's going on in the way. Uh, that was really helpful to me. I'm going to sign up for a transcript because there was so much <laughs> in what you just said, and you know I don't know whether that's more like mathematical chaos theory, which is so numerically dependent that it's hard to apply it even to behavior. Or something like uh, you see in macroevolution, where constraints can be productive and you're exploring in a more or less free but systematic manner a whole new set of possibilities that are opened up by a particular constraint. See, I, um, I, it may be that the people who do the math of dynamic system theory or chaos or complexity theory, whatever you want to call it, um, would um, sort of go like this with um, what, what I just said. But I think some of the people who are using these theories very successfully are people who do it in terms of behavior. Developmentalists have been using it enormously. There's a group in Boston that I'm part of. We've been working on how do people change in psychotherapy? What goes on really between the therapist and the patient? And we analyze at a very close level the interaction. And what we find is nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Right. <laughs> that there is a huge degree of unpredictability. That what most therapists do, especially when they're being supervised or stuff like that, is at the end of the session, you construct what happened and you tell it to somebody else or you tell it to yourself. But when you're in the middle of the session, when you're riding the crest of the present moment, the future there, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't even know what's going on if you tell the truth. And you can always make it up as you're going, right. but, the, but there are only moments when you have any certitude, and the rest of the time you can't know because you're in the flux of it. And what happens then is when you don't know, you get these strange, turbulent moments that either are really important or teeny, right. misunderstandings, sloppiness. The whole process of psychotherapy is unbelievably sloppy. <laughs> In this sense, mathematically speaking, it is truly, it is truly sloppy. Um, but that's where a lot of the creativity comes in. Just like the emergent, an emergent move, you know, comes in. And the, uh, f for for us, the um, the ability of the therapist to use the sloppiness becomes the most crucial feature in allowing a therapy that's geared to the person and not to the theory. Right. I mean, that, that's great stuff. It's acceptation and everything connected with it. Uh, it's the T.S. Eliot effect. Nothing looks the same again. And I wasn't trying to... Uh, no, I know you weren't. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I wasn't trying to say that the metaphors weren't terribly productive. I was just kind of uh, beginning a feeding frenzy to think you know, I've I've worked with the math. I know I know it pretty well. I, I wish we could come up with testable, risky hypotheses for play or psychotherapy or anything else based on explicit formal models. That's I was what I was trained to do, and I just didn't have the right stuff to make it happen. Are you actually at that point now where you can use them as formal mathematical structures to generate testable predictions, or are they still simply very fruitful metaphors? Um, uh, in the therapy session, they're fruitful metaphors. I'll bet that I could do an analysis of the mother and baby bear, though, that would be mathematically acceptable. Yeah, but I, you'd have to get to the micro behaviors to do it. Yeah. Well, you can do it. This is going to get much too technical for this okay. audience, unless there's some mathematicians here. But we can always shoot the breeze about it afterwards. You know, I, I would you know, applaud anybody who could pull that off. And if they'd like a copy of the video, just ask. <laughs> but um, the spontaneity and the sloppy... It's, 
metaphorical, unknown, unreconstructible is really where the dance therapy work is so um, honest, I would say, because the person moving or the people moving together do not know what's happened. If the dance therapist is very good in movement observation, they can recall in some way the events if that, and they can begin, again, metaphorically often, it was like, it seemed as if, but in the best work that I like, we wait to see if the person who has moved can recall the sensibility of those wonderful sloppy moments. And then the group or the, the interaction is, can we find that together or reconstruct it again so it can be a little more a guided improvisation. These are all steps in the process of trying to hold what those sloppy moments have been in which some realization of self has come about. So, but you described but I, it perfectly. But no, but I, I use sloppy in a very loose sense. Like for instance, the rock that Maxine found on the path. Right. That is an emergent property of the world messing around with you. Yeah. You know, it's unpredictable, that rock, etc. And then you, you do something. And actually, if you were in a playful mood, you could have done fun things to yeah. get over or by around the rock. Um, so it would then trigger uh, an improvisational moment. Um. It seems to me you're talking a lot about the way in which we anticipate and think we know when we don't really know, because we don't really know where we're going. If you posit a path, then we can posit a direction and a destiny or something. Uh, you know, we can posit movement, right? So, so it comes with your original. Oh, yeah. Oh, you're going, yeah. Okay, yes, back, back to that. No, I was just uh, saying this with respect to Dan's uh, description of the, of the whole process of psychotherapy, where you don't know where everything, how it's hanging together or, mm. or where you're going, that we have the sense that we, we know, and we usually have the sense of controlling what is going to happen, whereas we don't really know that was what I was picking up from you. Well, Maybe I mean, we should... uh, take a game that requires a lot of uh, timing, like soccer. Um, the, I think that the, the players have to think in movement, thinking through their yeah. movements um, every, every second. Um, and one of the beauties of that game, uh, which I've come to appreciate more living over there, is that um, you cannot predict what the complexion of the field will be like at any moment. In this sense, it's like basketball. And you have to have a physical, corporeal sense of where the action is and what are the potentials and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I am in deep agreement with your whole notions about movement and thinking through movement, I think that that encompasses the, um, the emergent, unpredictable stuff as well as the predictable stuff. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I do too. I didn't mean to Did I, uh, Maybe no, I misunderstood no, no. you then. No. I, I was thinking along different lines. Um, there, there, there's an interesting thing. But, uh, I'm just going to mention this one example. It seems to me a good example of how unaware we are of our habits and how ingrained they are in terms of uh, our tactile kinesthetic bodies. Because um, it occurred to me that, for example, uh, if someone else uh, took your toothbrush and brushed your teeth, you'd find that experience strange. But it wouldn't be because somebody else was holding your brush, and it wouldn't be because somebody else is standing in front of you. It's because you would feel and experience a different kinetic dynamics inside your mouth. Mm -hmm. now, what about that very strange state, using this as a hypothetical example, where a person is doing movements and it feels like somebody else 
is doing it. I mean, that's a pretty scary mental state to be in. And I, I can just imagine, you know, writing a very effective short story where somebody was brushing their teeth, but it felt like somebody else was doing the brushing. I mean, are there generalizations of that in therapy, for instance? Often people do feel that they are not moving themselves. Yeah. Whoa. They are move, moved from without because they have taken so much of their direction from the outside. I mean, this is the dance technique class where your response is not only to the person who's leading, but to the mirror image, which is what you're responding to. Are you correct in the mirror in contrast to the person who's been teaching you? And it's very much an outer directed thing. <coughs> Many dancers, at least for a long time, I find, do not check into their own kinesthetic feedback. Right. Am I doing this correctly? Which means, am I imitative? Yeah, well, the, the way we deal with this at our very rudimentary level is we just tell the kids to close their eyes and do their bar. How, how do they do it at a level where there's actually some significant skill? The problem with closing your eyes for a long time is that you need the balance and the eyes and the balance are not often st stable enough to then complete a double pirouette. I wouldn't want to do a double pirouette with my eyes closed. <laughs> Sounds like fun, though. <laughs> if you then have had some training about falling. Right, right. <laughs> and you can anticipate that person who isn't there to catch you. I mean, the dancer really becomes another body. And the integration of the dancer within his or her own body is when you begin to see something very special. But for a long time, you do carry the imitation of the other with you. So, and I think with people coming to dance therapy, that's one of the reasons they have come is they want to try, or at least they say, to find out something about themselves. Isn't that an interesting idea? At 40 or 50 years old, I'd like to learn something about myself. Makes me feel a little weepy. <laughs> it is. It often, it often has a lot of weepy, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. as people yeah. weep no, in I'm dance classes all the time. Getting it far. Any other questions from the audience? Here comes a question. Yes. Good. So, to introduce myself, uh, my name is Anirudh Tabathia, and uh, I'd like to actually jump back to thinking in motion. In movement. In movement, yeah. In movement, thinking in movement. So, I actually really sort of agree with that concept in, instinctively. But it starts me thinking, it makes me, <laughs> makes, makes me hard pressed to start thinking about defining thought. Because we now can talk about thinking in motion, uh, in movement, and thinking like linguistic thought. Mm -hmm. Then I start wondering, well, how many kinds of thought are there? Are there one kind of thought that's expressed through multiple mediums? And how are we really sort of, at what point are we calling something thought. And so, for example, is something running up my optic nerve a thought? You know, so I was just wondering if you could possibly comment on that. Well, um, I don't get into optic nerves or nerves <laughs> at all in terms of thinking, but I mean, I, th I think that um, uh, we can think in images. Thinking takes place spontaneously with us. I mean, we can concentrate on something and really pay attention to something and devote ourselves so that we're really um, wholly involved, focused on something. But our thinking and our thoughts are generated, they come by themselves. Uh, this is something that I think is uh, uh, certainly clear if, if you've practiced any form of, of uh, meditation like Vipassana, uh, where you really become aware of what the heck your mind is all about. <laughs> and it's a lot more, there's a lot more disarray than you would normally think. Um, <laughs> Another sloppy process. <laughs> <laughs> right. And um, thinking, we, we, see, we use the word, I think that, and then <coughs> because you're working on one dimension of thinking, and yet thinking and movement is not necessarily the thinking you just use those words for. Right. Okay. Um, I'm thinking in words now, I would say, trying to put into words what 
as an answer to your question. We think thoughts arise, they just come. And we can, as I say, focus on whatever it is. Sometimes what happens is that there are images. We have an image of something. It's like, hmm, what will I have to eat now? And there will be images that come. Those are, I, I classify those as thoughts. Oh, you know, and you have an image of what's in the refrigerator or whatever. <laughs> but uh, then if we're involved in something like moving, if we're involved in, the, in an improvisation group, or um, you were here last evening, if, if we were moving and there was no, no directions or no, nobody was programmed to do anything, that I call that thinking in movement because we were relating to other people, we were making something, we were creating something without any kind of um, uh, proddings or instructions, verbal instructions at all. But we were moving in concert with one another. And that takes thinking. It's like watching the bears, or it's like watching the movement improvisation, that, or even in a choreographed piece. That's thinking in movement in terms of listening to the dynamics. So that, to my mind anyway, in a dance like that, or even in, or the same thing in, in contact improvisation. You're not simply moving through a form, but the form is moving through you. And there's a great difference between the two because when you're simply moving through a form, you're doing something in a habitual way. That's why I was concerned about habit. And you're not, you're, you can be completely oblivious because you're doing it by road. It's some kind of perfunctory operation. When the form moves through you, you're attuned to the dynamics that are there in the whole of what of, of the movement itself, and you're you're present to that that kinetic aliveness. Right. And, and and even in I mean even in dance performance, this reconstruction of the thinking and movement is what makes you want to look at that performer. They are not doing a habitual set of Lissard, Tuchete, whatever it is, the movement vocabulary, they are, I hope, reconstructing and thinking in movement so that the spontaneity makes you respond to them. And that's when... Even though that, it's not spontaneous movement, even it's, though it's, it's set, it's choreographed, set, right. and well, it's been done for maybe a century. Yeah, century and a half. The umpteenth yeah. Swan Lake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, read Alistair McCullough today, the umpteen swan lake, and once, once again you fall in love with the swan queen because there is something she has found for that performance, which it's be and it, it becomes alive the, yeah. because it's created. Then I have a question for you, Maxine. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you anti-habit? <laughs> uh, in some ways, yes. Because aren't we talking about here the refreshing of a habit? Yes. The when, when Fontaine did Swan Lake, I had that experience of falling in love with her. Uh, some, you know, 10,000 performance or something. Falling in love with her and feeling improvisation in the movement. Are, and yet that movement is so in her nervous system that there was some relationship of her to that movement that was fresh, rather than the movement being fresh. In other words, inside the habit, or even with a habit, I mean, how could we exist without habits right. and all this uh, rote movement that we do? At the same time, there, I mean, I'm going back to your path now, and the rock, and Dan said the rock could be, uh, uh, a playful invitation, right? Like. Yes. What was the word about the deer? What word did you use about the deer in the water? It's a, a signal. It signals, causes the behavior. No, well, it's release something that release uh, release it. The stone, the rock, could be a releaser, or it could be enfolded. Seems to me like the thing. So, what gets that? Uh, what turns the stone into a releaser? You saw it as enfolded in your metaphor. Dan was saying, well, it could be a releaser. And so here's Swan Lake again, you know. Oh my God, Swan Lake, you know, nothing left to be said about it. And you go and you find yourself uh, transported. 
So the dancer must have found some kind of releaser or mm. knows about, spiritually has worked to create a releaser situation. Yeah, well, I, I, I just... And that's within the habit. I mean, that's like... A, yeah, but the, th the difference for me, but the way in which I would express this is that even as a form which the dancer knows, she's not moving through a form, but the form is moving through her. So it's being created anew. It has It's a exactly when you said that before that made me think this thought, because I thought, well, she is not moving habitually. The habit is moving through her. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just I just transform okay. the words. The, the do, do we need a word? Do we need a word that means sort of blind, dumb habit, and another word that means inspired, reconstructed habit, uh, <laughs> lived, emotive, <laughs> affective? I wouldn't call it habit <laughs> then, because exactly. Ha Why not? Because it's being present in the moment. But what Even if it's the it's same movement that you've been doing but that's all your an, life? That's an added kind of. That's an added outside third person. Um, so habit account means of it. Un, uh, that's means interesting. Uh, uh, so uh, I didn't see Fontaine re do. Re reimagined. Perhaps we can use the imagination. It's reimagined. The habit is reimagined and taken. Well, I would. I wouldn't call it a habit. I mean, in in that okay. in that kind of yeah. situation, I just don't Learned. don't think it's it's. Um, a habit in 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 the way that um, that you brush your teeth is a habit. Can yeah, I have you a here. Sure. Here's a question. <laughs> this is just briefly part of the discussion. I'm not asking you a question. Oh, oh, oh but he's, he's recording. Good. She, he wants the recording. Okay. Posterity, because um, <laughs> it's relating to this. Um, just because I'm an actor and I've been in a show where I've done over 300 performances of the same thing, and and thinking of this idea of habit and the distinction between an inspired habit or something that's practiced. And something that has the allure of being oh, spontaneous. That's a helpful word. I just the, the the word that came into my mind was mindful, mm -hmm. uh, as a performer, knowing that you're doing a practice movement. But if it's if you're if you connect it to a specific thought that you are having in that moment, mm -hmm. it is mindful, mm -hmm. and therefore it, it it is in the moment, and it has a spontaneity to it, which is alluring. Whereas Many nights, um, you don't have that inspiration. You're not mindful. You're doing it by rote, and it's different. And I think that the habit is is a pejorative because of that, that association with some phoning it in. Phoning it in is, is a kind of, you know, term we use in the theater for just your body's there, but your mind isn't. Yeah. But when the mind and body are connected, it could be something you've done a hundred times, but it's still breathes in the moment. And would you would you think of the what you're talking about as mindful, which I think is a very good uh, way of putting it too, that it's being present too. Right. Yeah. 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 And and the mind then is full of the kinesthetic feedback. It's full of the material that comes in in that I think the connecting the thought and the movement. Right. And because mindful often makes us think it is only cerebral. Oh, but, no. yeah. but no, we're talking mindful, the embodied mind. Right, the embodied mind. And the, and the feedback system is working, and this is what we anyway. keep longing for people to um, be conscious, being thoughtful in movement, so that they have a sense of what it is that's happening, and they can then work with it and play with it, too. You see, and if you are mindful and as a performer, you it comes to you that perhaps without spoiling the whole ensemble of the evening, you might work with the dynamic of it, or the vocal quality, or the rhythmic quality, all of which makes for the spontaneity and the surprise, which might be fun. Thank you. have been waiting a long time. Um, thank you. I'm Bob Strzok. I'm a clinical psychology student at the New School. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to see this group uh, collect collected here. I I'm also uh, an actor uh, part-time. I'm in a theater group um, that works non-verbally for the most part. Uh, so we, I've never had the experience of doing 300 shows in a row uh, and had forcing myself to be mindful each night. But actually, the work that we do um, and the work that we did last night in the uh, in the improvisation in the, in the movement, the workshop, is very similar to some of the workshops that we do. We work non-verbally. Uh, we work with ritual forms. We uh, 
we try to we see what the audience we see what the people see what the guests bring also and work with that um, but what I was thinking about um, the title of the uh, of this uh, uh, program is about the languaging experience the and uh, what I think in your description about how uh, movement uh, pre uh, is a prelude to, to speech um, and I know in dr. Stern's work it's I mean that's Babies learn, learn, think by moving. That's how we think first. Um, and then thinking about um, also just in the history, I mean, human history, uh, how ritual uh, preceded um, speech, that human movement, that movement was the way that human beings uh, first uh, communicated meaning. And that, uh, and I, and I, to get it back to the idea of the, to the habit uh, question, actually, um, that ritual is a series of movements, but it's the, the process of ritualization is how the meaning is created and how ritual itself, um, when it's not done, just like in performance actually, and we look at the, the sort of the bridge in my theater group work, the bridge between ritual and performance, and that when it's not being created in the moment, uh, it's it does become empty in some way. Um, we, we, we find places where we try to break habits, um, put ourselves into a place where we don't know, and not knowing is kind of where we want to be. Um, and I've tried to tie this to my, to my clinical work, as I work as a clinician, the only thing that it's, it's, uh, I've been able to do is I can sit in the room with anybody, because I can be present in the moment, but uh, other than that, I haven't really been able to, to mesh the two. I don't know if you want to talk about ritual or anything there. <laughs> Um, can I say a word Surely. here? About coming back to languaging movement, um, um, I, I'd like to just for a moment take a position that's a little more exaggerated than I really believe, but I think it's worth doing it, and that is to run with, um, with Maxine's basic idea of thinking in movement um, through, or through movement. Um, um, her book on the primacy of movement, uh, for me, captures so much because a lot of the, mm, the neuroscience stuff now about um, language and what it does to the mind is starting to be very interesting in this regard. Not only are there the um, corporeal concepts that you bring up, or the kinesthetic concepts, or the primary metaphors, that, like uh, we went so far. Um, but uh, it, it turns out that with um, at least many of the words they've studied, if, if the words are howl, scream, cry, then they go to the language center. They also go to the auditory center, where we're not talking about language. If you say, jump, run, step, the, wor the words will fire off in your brain not only the language center to understand them, but also to go to the motor center where you would jump, whatever I said. So in other words, there is a parallel processing in, in movement of the language. Um, they haven't finished doing all of this, uh, I mean, with regard to all kinds of words. And, um, but it, 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 it sort of complicates in a wonderful way the problem. The other thing is people who've been studying these mirror neurons that allow you to um, have the virtual experience of being inside another person's mind or body um, indicate that when they say something to you, um, you can experience the word part by also having it trigger off mirror neurons so that you would be doing the thing that they're talking about. And when it doesn't happen right, you can, like for instance before, Maxine, you were saying, uh, well, you know, it arises, it arises. And I had trouble with that movement because that's falling down. And I think of arising as going this way. Now, it, it's a very simple thing, but when you think about it, there's a conflict in that. And you have to see it in terms of the, the rhythm of the punctuation that you were doing, because you, you did several movements of this kind, and 
and the arising of the thing. But it wasn't arising. <laughs> um, and so the, the linguistic part of it and the movement part of it are very intimately related, probably all of the time. I'm sure there are exceptions, and this is an exaggerated point of view, because I see that the movement remains primary, is what I'm really trying to say. Well, I was just trying to break the habit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, she would, but you're also getting down underneath from the place where, because you cannot go up unless you go down, as everybody know who has done a plie, right? Yeah. <laughs> you have to bend before you jump. And that, that makes me think of my, my background, really, in, in philosophy is uh, very, very strongly in phenomenology, which is very, very much concerned with getting to the foundations. So foundations, from that point of view, the, getting everything grounded in experience, really grounded. So um, that may be part of it, too. Um, Nine o'clock. Yes. Nine o'clock. Look, look behind well, you. Uh, pardon? Is there somebody who wants to be at the mic? No. Well, I thank everyone for a very invigorating and lively time of it, and I hope that uh, everyone enjoyed the conversation.